When you're a believer in Christ, you'll have the peace that surpasses all understanding. And you can't get that peace anywhere else. You get it from the Lord Jesus Christ. And James 1, 2 talks about our trials are, are an opportunity. And it, you look at that and you go, man, that's an opportunity for, for a witness. It's an opportunity for me to grow. And when we are going through something really difficult and we have peace, people notice that. I just want you to imagine, right? Imagine a modern day, like, kids' Christmas pageant. Maybe you don't have to imagine this. Maybe you did that this week. Maybe you're doing that next week. They're always exhilarating. They're always exciting. Very professional. And the biggest excitement you have is that someone's kid doesn't get the memo to not behave in a way that is completely inappropriate, right? That's what we hope for, right? At best, someone flies off the handle. The angel says a swear word, right? This is the excitement of the, the Christmas pageant. But here's what I want you to picture. I want you to picture uh, the, the, a modern day nativity scene. And then I want you to imagine that at whatever Christmas pageant you've been to, that Joseph and Mary are sitting in the front row. The actual Joseph and Mary from the Christmas story. And they're watching it. And as they're watching it, do you think they're going, yeah. This is very similar to our actual experience. Or do you think they would sit there and go, oh, no, 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 no. You see, one thing we need to understand about us as human beings is we are least aware of what's most familiar to us. Wouldn't you agree? Like whatever's most consistent in your life is what you're probably least aware of, right? Like uh, you don't tell your heart to beat. You don't really even think about your breathing until you, have you ever thought about breathing like late at night and you start to go like, oh no, I have to breathe, right? And then you like take over your body's autopilot system and you start breathing yourself and you're like, oh, what, does my body just do this all the time without me thinking about it? The answer is yes, right? Or every time your mom says, fix your posture, you gotta go, you know? It's funny because whenever I say that, I watch people go, oh yeah, oh yeah. We don't think about it. In the same way, right, I, I think I was 12 when I had the Christmas story memorized because it was just like, meow, 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 right? It was like Charlie Brown's teacher, meow, 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 meow. And this season can be a time where we kind of nod to God. We technically go, like, it's kind of your birthday and stuff, but we've got family coming in, and we've got, you know, Aunt Joni's going to come tell me how my house is never clean enough. And then, oh, my, here come the in-laws. When are you going to get a real job, kid? And it's like, I'm 45, right? <laughs> like, whatever. And so we have all these other pressures and all these other thoughts. And sometimes I think the enemy's uh, one of the, the things that he does best is that we've kind of hallmarkized and, and we've traditionalized and we've made Christmas so copacetic that when we think about it, it kind of gives us these warm fuzzies as if when Jesus entered into the world, it was somehow a copacetic, clean, warm and fuzzy experience. And it just wasn't. I think Joseph and Mary would look at a modern day nativity and go, what? If you think, if you think of modern day nativity, there is almost nothing biblically accurate about it. I'm not here to ruin your Christmas, but here we go. Right? <laughs> if you're like one of those, like you walk around Christmas season with like the light up, you know, Christmas lights around your neck and you always wear Christmas sweater, this might be your time to leave whatever campus you're at or if you're watching online. Here we go, right? I've warned you ahead of time, right? <laughs> Everything we think about we kind of made it into this more traditional, a little bit more warm, fuzzy. But think about it. Jesus was born into scandal, right? We've got Mary, who was probably the age of about 13, 14. What? This is where the craziness starts, right? If your modern day nativity scene has Mary as, Mary as some kind of a financially savvy 24-year-old who has her life together, if you see that in a, in a nativity scene, you need to right away go, this is, this is heresy, Okay. It's important that you scream that out and make everyone very uncomfortable. But she's probably 13. She's married to Joseph, who was a tecton, which in the Greek means he works with his hands, probably not a carpenter. Sorry to ruin that for you too. Jesus probably wasn't a carpenter. He probably was a 
quarry worker. He was probably a stonemason. He built things with stone. The reason we know that is if you go to Israel and look for wood, good luck, <laughs> right? It's just not there, right? You've got palm trees, which aren't really trees. And if you've ever tried to build a house out of palm tree, it's not gonna go super well. It's like fibrous tissue, right? So he probably worked and he, was a, he, was a, he laid stone, he laid brick for a job. So you've got, you have Joseph, who when he hears that Mary's pregnant is like, I am out. And the angel's like, don't be out, right? What is in her is from the Lord, right? And he's, so he's freaking out. But then here's the scandal. Mary comes home and she starts to show and everyone's like, are you gonna ask, right? Like, <laughs> you ever ask someone when their babies do? No, I, if there is a woman who is skinny as a twig except for a belly that goes like this, I will still never say, so when is the baby due? It's just like, it's the gamble of all gambles. But she starts to show and everyone's kind of like, Mary's different, <laughs> right? Like she's, she keeps throwing up every morning and she's just, their shape is different, right? Oh, don't worry. What is in me is from the Lord. I was conceived by the, the, the baby was conceived by the Holy Spirit. I'm a virgin. I have had no uh, intimacy with man. And it says in the Bible that Joseph and her didn't have any intimacy until after the baby was born, although they did get married. Think about Joseph. Joseph gets all the criticism and none of the fun. He's just, he's just the height of scandal. And he's sitting there going like, it's not my baby, right? Like he's all bent out of shape. And then how does a Christmas story start? In those days, Caesar Augustus, Caesar Augustus, what? You've got the people of God, Israel, who are under Roman oppression, a godless polytheistic society who has taken them as a vassal state and they're underneath this Roman oppression. And this is the Christmas story. It's not warm and calm and copacetic. It is the, an oppressed people with a 13-year-old girl who is now married to a 20-year-old dude who's real frustrated about everything. The town is in scandal. And this was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor over Syria. So now they're getting taxed out of their minds. They gotta go back to their homes. And in that home city, they're gonna have to pay more money in taxes because that's why you do censuses. So they're paying all this money to Rome and, and, and the word that the Bible uses for the time that Jesus was born is the word kairos. Romans chapter five, at just the right time. Now, if I'm God, which I'm not, and you're grateful, if I was God, the Christmas story would be very different, right? There's almost, there'd always be no association with the actual Christmas story because everything goes against conventional wisdom. Why would you do it at this time? Why would you do it under these circumstances? Why would you choose a 13 year old? Why would you have the quarry worker? Why not, to, why not have him be of kings? Why not, why not make his proclamation to the high and to the astute, to, the, to the, 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 the fame of society? Why the disenfranchised and the lowly and the meek and the mild and the poor and the oppressed? Why them? And the story continues. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem. So he's born in Bakersfield, okay? It's technically on the same line of latitude as Bakersfield over in the Middle East. And people literally say in scripture, they say, what good can come from Nazareth? I have heard this same thing said about Bakersfield. <laughs> now I'm from Bakersfield, so... Yes, we are a weird, messed up people. I recognize that. But don't worry, we breathe in all your smog. Okay, this is Bakersfield. So he, he's born in Nazareth. And as you, as you watch the, the God of all things, he is, he's omniscient, omnipresent, omnipotent. He's all powerful, all knowing, all places at once. He's outside of time. He's not bound by it. He can manipulate it and change it. He can go here. If this is the timeline of all of human history, he, he's not bound by it. He, he allows himself in the form of Jesus to be subject to Newtonian law, but he himself is not governed by it in his nature. And he uses this word kairos. It is the perfect time. He likes the circumstances, friends. He thinks this is the way the Bible should be written. This is the Petri dish that is going to grow the story of my salvation. It's messy, it's messed up, it's oppressive. It's the disenfranchised and the lowly. It's the meek and the oppressed. It is those who are the lowest of society. 
As Jesus enters the picture, Isaiah is going to tell us he himself was not an attractive person. He wasn't tall. He didn't have great stature. There was nothing about his appearance that would attract us to him. And the Christmas story continues. While they were there, while they were where? While they were in a foreign town of Bethlehem, which in the Hebrew literally means the house of bread. That's what Bethlehem means, which Jesus is the bread of life. Cool little coincidence there. Who knows? And as, as they're there in Bethlehem during a census, which means there's been a groundswell in the town because everyone's gone back and it's time for them to travel. So the inns and the hotels are overflowing with people and the God of the universe says, Kairos, at just the right time. See, how many of us, when we're seeking God's will for our life, we kind of test the waters of whether or not it's simple or not. We know that God's in something if everything pans out perfectly. You ever said this before? Well, we'll know God is in it because he will open doors that he wants us to walk through and close ones that he doesn't. That sounds great, huh? But if you were Joseph and if you were Mary and you were convinced that you were caring because, right, you ever heard that song? Mary, did you know that you me, boy? Also, Quick question to Jeremy. I haven't been asked to sing on the worship team. Feels very political to me why I haven't been asked, but you know what I mean? Whatever. Um, what's the answer to the question, Mary, did you know? Yeah, she did, because the angel told her this is exactly what's going to happen. So she had, she had foreknowledge of what she was carrying inside of her. She sings a song about it in Luke chapter one. So she's aware of what's going on. But how many of us, if we did the test of God's will in our life the same way that Mary and Joseph would have, they would have said, this is not the right thing. They would have gone to Bethlehem and they would have gone, well, if God is in this, if this is God's will, then it'll be simple. And as soon as they got to Bethlehem, there was no room for, the, for them in the end, they would have gone, mm -mm, we're not supposed to be here. Because we, this is not the way that we had it pictured in our mind. But you see, friend, I think the beauty of the Christmas story is that Joseph and Mary find themselves in the middle of the will of God and yet in the middle of a crazy, messed up mess. Did you know that? How many of us think in our lives, why is everything so messy? Where is God? Where is his presence? Where is his will? Where is his divine authority? Where is his, where is his supreme rule and reign? And the book of Hebrews says that God in his fullness, the book of Colossians says, the fullness of the character of God when it dwelt in human flesh was in Jesus Christ, who always did the will of God. And what did the will of God look like in the life of Jesus? Messy, messed up, weird, broken, backwards, what in the heck is going on type of life? And the more that we copaceticize, is that a word? It is now. The more that we make Christmas, we relegate it to the hallmark, the Christmas pageants, and buy it hook, line, and sinker, we look at our own craziness and we think to ourselves, what has God to say about my mess? For he came into peace and calm and gentleness. No, he did not. I've had five kids. I've had zero kids. I, I have five kids. And I was present for all of their births. And I was present for all their births, at least four of them, in a modern day 21st century hospital, okay? Our fifth baby was born in the corner of our bedroom. It is what it is. Uh, that was a different experience entirely. But think ancient Near Eastern medicine, ancient Near Eastern birthing practices. I want you to be Joseph in the stable, right? The cattle are lowing, the baby awakes. But little Lord Jesus. And why haven't you been asked to sing in the choir? <laughs> no crying he makes. What are you talking about? Where does the Bible say the baby didn't cry or poop or whine? Was he colicky? Probably because it sanctifies the mom and the dad. That's what colic does, right? Like if you survive that, you can survive anything. And this is Jesus in a podunk town and in, 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 in a stable, right? In our nativity scenes, our stable's made of wood. That's the case, there wasn't even wood. He was born in what we probably consider to be like a cave, a rock cave, right? And at least, at least there's some things that are accurate, right? The three wise men show up on the scene in your nativity scene. We three kings of Orient are bearing gifts, we travel afar. 
they're not kings. We don't know if there were three. And if by Orient you mean Asia, you're wrong. Whoa, star of wonder, right? Like, bro, if you've got wise men at your nativity scene, probably at the age of two they showed up, right? And why are there three wise men? Because there's three gifts, so we assume everyone brought one. There could have been two who brought three gifts. There could have been nine, and they brought three gifts. We don't know, but there's always three of them. They're African, they're African astrologers is what they are, right? There go the wise men. Fantastic. And if you watch a Christmas pageant, and you see an angel that has wings, you stand up. If you take the Bible seriously, then you stand up and you say, get that kid out of the nativity scene right now. First of all, angels don't have wings. That's biblical. Secondly, sorry if I just ruined angels for you, right? If your angel's like some floating naked baby, you're like, hi. So I doubt these are warriors, right? And where do the angels show up? Out in the fields. And who do they talk to? The pleasant, kindly, lowly shepherds. No, the shepherds were probably like in a locker room conversation like you would at a football team. They are, they are, the, they are the disenfranchised. They are the ones who are against all this stuff. They don't care. How many of the shepherds living out in the fields nearby made regular sacrifices in the temple? Zero, you weren't allowed. It was such a despicable occupation to have that no one would ever get caught dead being a shepherd because you, 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 you were constantly in fecal matter. You were constantly unclean. So instead of trying to go and make sacrifices and go through the process of cleanliness, they said, forget it, we're out. I didn't even worry about it anymore. So they're having their like guy time, right? Hanging out, talking about who knows what. I guess God does know. But there's just really bad things. And then an angel shows up and he says, fear not. And they're probably like, we are gonna die, right? Like, Jeff, you shouldn't have said that. There's angels here now, right? An angel shows up and he says, fear not, for I bring you good news. That's where we get the word euangelion, gospel. I bring you the gospel. I bring you good news of great joy. For today in the city of David, a savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. And the manifestation of the presence of the almighty God of the universe in human flesh is a declaration to the disenfranchised that there is a means of salvation for the absolute repression and complete depravity of the brokenness of who you are as shepherds. It begins Jesus' ministry as a friend to sinners that the great declaration of the gospel of Christ comes to the sinners. Your Bible doesn't say, and there were kings eating a feast in a village nearby, and the, the gold of their plates shone around them. There were shepherds living out in a field nearby, keeping watch over their flocks by night, which means that the Christmas season did not happen during the Christmas season. If they were in their fields, it was probably the middle of June, because you don't take your sheep out in the fields in the middle of winter in the ancient Near East. It's freezing. So if you thought that Christ Jesus was born December 25th, sorry, he wasn't. Okay, Christians stole that because it was a pagan holiday and we tried to redeem it. It was, a, it was a winter solstice. We took it back. It is what it is, right? Don't get all up in arms about that. It's not a big deal. Merry Christmas, everyone, okay? <laughs> so the date's wrong. The people at this, the thing is wrong. The smell, like imagine the smell, right? Imagine you sitting there and your wife and, right? If you've ever been, <laughs> it's like, if a little drummer boy shows up in the middle of this, I would drop kick him, Right? Mary's screaming, the goats are like licking your leg. You're like, get off of me, right? The cattle are mooing and pooping and mooing some more. You sit down in the hay and it's damp and you don't know why it's damp, but you can only imagine. But you've stopped caring because you're so tired because you just traveled across the known world at that time to come write your name down on a piece of parchment so that Caesar can take more money from you. You're at the end of your rope and everywhere you've gone, Mary looks at you like, do they have a room? And you're like, no. And she's like, oh, I need a room. It's like, oh, do you, Mary? Do you need a room? I'm aware of the circumstances, Mayor. <laughs> and if you're sitting there and a kid walks up like this, is this a good time? <laughs> Come, they talk, right? 
it is not a good time, right? Like, I don't want to go back to prison, but you need to get out of here because I will kick a child if I have to, okay? Mary's like, get rid of him. (laughs) I love how the book of Luke, chapter two, verse 19 says it. It says, Mary is observing all this and it says she pondered up all these things in her heart. And I wonder what her question was. It's probably a simple one. Where in the heck and what in the heck is going on right now? And the more that we've made Christmas into a hallmark holiday, the more that we've failed to understand that our God is a God of peace in the middle of the chaos, that's more what your life looks like, doesn't it? There's scandal, there's brokenness, (laughs) it stinks. You're confused. Maybe your point question in your life right now is where is God in the midst of all this? How could I possibly be in the middle of God's will if I'm in the middle of this mess? Why hasn't he cleared the decks for the simplicity of my life if I am following in what he wants me to do? Why this time? Why this place? Why this person? This marriage is in conflict. How could you possibly call me to X, Y, and Z? This, this, my friend, is the Christian walk. And the more that we present to our neighbors around us that God is a God who comes into the peaceful, still, silent night, There's nothing silent about that night, whether it's Mary yelling at Joseph, Mary yelling at the pain of labor. You ever heard a girl when she's in labor? She's not like, "Mm, that was a contraction. It's like guttural. It's like, you're like, baby, I'm I'm scared, so I'm gonna walk out. I'm a little bit uncomfortable with the noises you're making, right? Is there a demon in you? Because that was deep and loud, and I've never heard you speak speak in that low of a tone of voice before. (laughs) Also, please watch your language. I don't want the first thing our baby hears to be the words you're saying. (laughs) She's like, what have you done to me? He's like, I legitimately wasn't me, right? It just, it wasn't me. (laughs) You can't even get mad at me. He's like the first dad ever who's been able to be like, no, no, no. (laughs) You can talk to the Holy Spirit about this one because I know, no. I'm not gonna take the blame if I didn't even have the fun. I'm not doing it. It just feels like a proper understanding of the Christmas story is more like, oh yeah, I think Jesus would fit in my family, you know? This this feels like where I could legitimately say Emmanuel, God with us. Like this is what God with us feels like in the middle of all that junk. And yet we, there's the things that we're most familiar with, the familiarity breeds contempt and we don't think about it very often. And we use this phrase all the time as Christians that we have the peace of God, peace, 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 right? Here's what the Bible says. It, in the declaration of who Jesus is going to be in Isaiah chapter nine, here's what it says. Uh, you might know this by heart. And that's the problem is we know it by heart. We know it by heart, but we don't believe it in our heart. That's the difference. Is kale good for you? Probably. Is pizza bad for you? Yeah, you know what? (laughs) Maybe that was a bad example. (laughs) No, I've been reading lately. (laughs) Complex carbs and cheese are good for the heart. I mean, if it's a pros or con list, which one's better for you? Most of us would go, I I would agree. Probably eating kale versus eating like a large pizza probably is, you know, there's probably not a lot of argument that goes along with that there. But if I ask you, when's the last time you ate a meal full of kale versus when's the last time I asked you to eat, when's the last time you ate pizza? It's like, well, that's very different, right? I might know intellectually that's better for me, but it doesn't actually change the way that I live. This is what the Bible, when the Bible uses the word believe in God or trust in God, it's not a mental assent that if you gave me a scantron, I know that God offers peace. It is a peace that sits in your soul and it characterizes your life. There's a difference. When the Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him, it's not like you might believe in Santa to go, he's there. That's not what, that's not, that's never what the Bible means by belief. It always means whole body, whole self, whole soul, jumping into trusting fullness of who I am and the fullness of who he is. It changes the way that I spend my money, the way I spend my time, I do my relationships, I change, it changes my marriage, it changes my parenting, it changes everything from the inside out. It is a whole, Romans chapter 12, one and two, transformation of the mind, metanoia, it changes everything. And if it doesn't change 
everything. It has literally done nothing, okay? Belief in God that makes no difference in your life is insufficient to save your soul. This is, it's the, the receipt of God in our life that we see in scripture, the fruit of the spirit, the, the manifestation of God working in our hearts is love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, faith, and the gentleness and self-control. Against such there is no law. And, and yet we've gotten away in our society with simply saying, no, I believe in God. And the Bible says, but what does that mean? Do you believe in God in the same way that you believe kale is good for you? In the same way that you think that smoking is bad? But does it actually change the way that you are? Does it metanoia? Does it change your mind? Does it adjust? Now, it doesn't mean you're gonna be perfect. It doesn't mean your life is always full of love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, kind of gentleness, self-control. But it certainly should adjust something. That's the receipt of grace given. Is life changed? It's the receipt. It's not predicated. It's not, I gotta get good so God will love me. It's God loves me, so I'm gonna walk with him. And that's gonna look like goodness. And here's the declaration of Jesus coming. This is an Old Testament prophecy. For a child is born to us, right? This is already a scandal. Like, how confident would you be as the king of the world to send a baby? You know how easy it would be to kill him? But see, when you're part of God's sovereign plan, all the armies of the world standing against that infant will not prosper. There is no weapon formed against him that shall stand. So God goes, let me show you my divinity. Let me show you my su supremacy. I'll bring a baby in, and guess what? You're going to have a king called Herod who's going to search for him and try to kill him, and they're not, it's not going to succeed because I am in control of all things. A son is given. The government will rest on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Now, we've got to use the proper dictionary when we're talking about these things. Because if you go, well, if God's in my life, then I'm going to experience in the Greek is where we get the name Irene. Irene. Irene is the Greek word for peace. But we can't then implicate our modern understanding of peace on a biblical promise of Jesus bringing peace and then judge God's presence in our life accordingly. What is the difference between these two things? If you uh, go to the next one, Okay, this is what the Bible says. And, and, and so Jesus, even 2,000 years ago, he says, you have to use a proper dictionary when you're talking about the promise of peace in your life. Do, don't worry about anything. That's a strange command from the Bible, right? Don't worry about anything. Now, worry is very different than pressure, right? Think of the analogy of William Tell. Guy puts an apple on his head. His father shoots that apple off his head, Okay? The man firing the arrow feels pressure, right? There's something he can do. He can aim better. He can think about his practices. The guy with the apple on his head with his eyes closed and blindfolded, what can he do? Nothing. In fact, to move or to act would make things worse. He experiences worry. The Bible says, do not worry. If it is outside of your hand, it is still in the Father's hand, but you dwelling on it and surmising about it and plotting against it can do nothing. How many of you by worrying can add a single minute to your life? Consider the ravens. They do not eat, they do not reap or soil, but they are fed every day by the Lord Jesus Christ. And consider the tulips in the field, consider the daisies, consider the flowers of the field. They do not spin, they do not toil, and yet not even Solomon in all of his splendor was clothed like one of these. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow saying, what will we eat, what will we drink, what will we wear? But trust in God. Are you gonna have pressure in your life? Yes, respond accordingly, biblically, through God's wisdom. Pressure is something we can control. It's making good choices. It's not starting fights. It's, it's taming our tongue, the book of James says. But worry are things outside of our control. And the Bible says it really clearly. Don't worry about anything. Because when you take a step back and ask the question of wisdom, why would you? It's not gonna fix anything. Pray about everything. Guess who can fix the things you're worried about? the one that you communicate to through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. He has made a way. He's, he's built a telephone line now from your heart to the God of the universe. Pray about it. He can change things that are outside of your control. So pray about everything. Don't you love the connection here? Don't worry about anything. Pray about everything. 
Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Then you will experience God's peace, right? This is biblical peace. Biblical peace is not the same thing as the world's peace. Not the same. If you use the world's definition of peace and superimpose that on your life, you're going to go, there is no God in my life. But you have to listen to what it says. Experience God's peace, peace, which exceeds, or in the Greek, it surpasses all understanding. This is an interesting phrase. The epistle writer says here, the peace that God offers to the world will not make sense. The Bible loves this. We call it kingdom economics, that in God's kingdom, the things of this world seem foolish. And to the world, the kingdom economics seem foolish. You see, when you talk about you finding comfort and solace in the king of the universe, the world thinks you're foolish. They think, bring up your store, store more in your storehouses, make more money in your bank account, get better insurance, get the kids in better sports programs so that they can pay for themselves for college. These are, and if you experience all these things, you will have peace. This is not kingdom economics. That's worldly economics. If you get the right insurance plan, if you get that new job offer, if you're able to get the white picket fence, then you will be able to protect yourselves from the brokenness of this world, and then you will have peace. This is the peace that the world can give you. Jesus says, the problem with that is as quickly as the world can give it to you, it can be taken away. His peace will do what? It will guard your hearts and minds. My wife passed away last year to suicide. And people ask me all the time, why do you have such peace? And I say, friend, what do you mean? Am I scared? Do I not know what's coming tomorrow? You're you're asking me, do I experience worldly peace? Sometimes no, but I've got something much deeper and it has guarded my heart and my mind. I don't, it's a protection. What do you mean it's protection? And here's what we're gonna talk about here in a second. Let me make sure I do this correctly. Boop, boop. Next slide. I did it. Worldly peace. What is, (laughs) the monkey did it. Worldly peace. Here's the promise of worldly peace. Here's the three things I wanna give you. Worldly peace is circumstantial. Could you imagine anything more troubling in the heart that you have than if your peace was built on such a shaky foundation as your ever-changing circumstances of your life? With all the money and all the riches of the world, you still couldn't protect yourself from cancer hitting. You couldn't bring yourself a, a lack of infertility. You couldn't, you couldn't stop the hemorrhage that you don't know about. You couldn't stop the aneurysm in your brain. You, you, and this, we see this time and time again. We watch rich people die all the time. They can't stop it. Tom Brady is asked in an interview a few years back if he is satisfied with his life. He's, at the time, he was married to a supermodel. It was like his third Super Bowl ring. He had everything. He had all the money. He was Solomon, man. He had everything in the world that he could possibly want. And in an interview, he is asked, are you satisfied? And he says, no. And, I, and here's what he says verbatim. He says, and I think to myself, God, there's got to be more than this. And it's like, bro, you're so close. I know you just use his name as a curse word, but if you use his name as an answer, you'd be satisfied. If you stopped cursing at him and instead seek him as wise men do, you're going to find a difference in your life. To the contrary, in the same year, a a few years later actually, uh, Trevor Lawrence is about to walk into the national championship as the quarterback of Clemson. This is like an 18-year-old dude with long, shaggy hair. He doesn't have a dollar to his name. This is before the whole you can pay college athletes and everything. And he could blow out his knee. He could lose any kind of contracts that he has. He's walking into the national championship and they say, what kind of pressure do you feel? You know what his answer was? I don't feel any because football doesn't define me. I'm defined by Jesus and what he says is ultimate and supreme in my life. So I could win, I could lose, doesn't change who I am. Now, in a worldly point of view, the world's gonna go, you fool. But in their heart, it would be interesting to find Tom and Trevor in the same room and find out who would be asking who questions. 
what do you have, right? It's like this indefinable, why aren't you freaking out? But the worldly peace is circumstantial. Secondly, worldly peace is fragile, right? It's easily breakable. It's easily changed. The job can end. The stock market can crash. The stock market has crashed, right? (laughs) Bitcoin is a future, right? Sorry, friend. Maybe it's a distant future, but right now it's not the present, right? It's fragile. It changes every day. Oh, don't worry. As soon as I marry him, I'll experience peace. As soon as I am in a relationship with her, then I will. And then infidelity hits. And then the brokenness comes. And the divorce papers are on your desk. And your peace is gone. It's fragile. Thirdly, the worldly peace is fleeting. If you ever experience total and complete, uh, like, serenity in your household, it's pierced by a nagging thought. Like every once in a while, like all the kids are in bed and I'm sitting on a couch and it, it's, it's like finances are in good shape. I, I, I know what we're doing tomorrow. I'm excited about something coming up. And then I start to worry. Guess what I worry about? When is this gonna stop, right? Every time we sit in perfect peace, we go, oh no, now I gotta preserve this thing. And our peace is gone again. Because we're trying to hold it, right? We're trying to like grasp the wind, as the Old Testament says, or, or restrain oil in your hand, right? Someone's like pouring water through your hand and it's peace. And you're like, stop, 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 stop. You can't do anything. You can't even hold on to it. Biblical peace is different. Here's what Jesus says. He's, he tells his disciples for the first time in a way that makes a little more sense to them. In John chapter 14, he says, I'm gonna leave. And they're like, come again? I'm gonna be executed. They have, they have no understanding of a suffering savior. They have no comprehension that Messiah is gonna die. They're ready for him to go, Hosanna, overthrow Rome, go take down the powers that be. You're gonna be our oppression's savior. You will, like Moses, free us from the hand of Pharaoh. Jesus says, I'm gonna go die. Peter goes, oh, no, you're not. Jesus says, Peter, you're like Satan. Peter's like, well, that was intense, right? That was a lot. The good thing about Peter, when, when Jesus calls you Satan, all your days after that can only be better than that, you know? When the God of the universe calls you Satan, there's no, you can only go up from there. That's great. He says, do not let your hearts be troubled. You trust in God, so trust also in me. In my Father's house, there are many rooms. He's using ancient Near Eastern wedding language. This is how you used to propose to someone. You would say, in my father's insula, my father's house, there are many rooms because our family is large. And so when I would engage myself to someone, then I would go back home and I would build a room onto my father's house. And when it was completed, it was time for the wedding. So Jesus is using wedding language. Trust in the Lord, trust also in me. And he says, in my father's house, there are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm gonna go there and prepare a place for you. And once I've gone and prepared that place for you, I'm gonna come back and bring you with me that where I am, there you may be also. Thomas says, well, how are we gonna get there? Jesus says, John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. They continue, what in the heck are you talking about? Jesus says, do not let your hearts be troubled. He keeps saying, my peace I give to you, my peace I I leave you. Then he says this phrase, but I do not give you peace as the world gives. It's different. It's biblical peace. It's anchored. It's different because it's not, it's it's not like shifting sand. You see, biblical peace is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. It says, the kingdom of heaven will not, the people that will not inherit the kingdom of God are, and then it's this list of vices, this list of, of vice identities. It doesn't say people who have committed murder at one point. It says the kingdom of God will not have murderers in it or liars or cheaters or drunkards. You see, it's identity language. And the beauty of it is it doesn't stop there. The next verse is, and that is who you once were. But you've been bought, you've been washed, you've been cleansed. And now you are in Christ. You have a new identity. First Corinthians says, the old has gone, the new has come. You see, the peace that I have is not based on my circumstance, it's based on my identity. It's not based in future hope, it's based in historical certainty. Jesus Christ took away the punishment for my sin. My peace is not derived from my circumstance. It's derived from the most consistent being in all of times, admission that I am his son. I don't strive for his love. 
God's faithfulness is not built on my faithfulness. It's built on his solemn, unchanging word. So it's anchored. And just like an anchor, you can shift the boat, you can send the waves, you can send the storms, and it's not going to change. Secondly, it's bulletproof. We do, why don't we worry about tomorrow? Because tomorrow has no capability to take me out of the palm of God's hand. Romans 8, 38 and 39. For I am convinced, Paul says, that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, nor things present, nor things to come, nor principalities, nor rulers, nor anything in all of creation can separate me from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. In other words, what have I to fear? Lastly, it's eternal. The peace we experience in Christ doesn't end when our circumstances change. It doesn't end. And in fact, the strife and the lack of peace in your heart that you experience right now, if you're a blood-bought child of the Most High God, if you've surrendered your life to Jesus, you are as close to hell as you're ever gonna be right now. And without Jesus, without Jesus, we will be as close to heaven as we're ever gonna be right now. But for the one who finds our identity in Christ, the unshakable, unchanging, bulletproof identity, we have nothing to look forward to but everything in Christ. The anthem of our peace. One great early church father used this phrase. Here's what he said. You can go to the next one. The reason we have peace as Christians, and this should be the anthem of some of our hearts if we're experiencing this kind of tribulation on an ongoing basis, our bad things turn out for good. This is the Christian promise that the hardest and worst things in your life, there is an ultimate justice. If you've experienced deep injustice, it doesn't all get caught in the wash. There's a God who sees all. The Bible says, do not be deceived. God will not be mocked. He sees everything. He knows everything. The book of Revelation chapter 21 says, behold, I am poreomai, I am making all things new. Even that the book of Genesis says, what the, what the enemy intended for evil, God intended for good. God will take everything. He will take suicide. He will take brokenness. He will take pain. He will take cancer. He will take all these things. And there's no promise that here on this earth, something's gonna get better, but that ultimately God will turn all things into good. Our second promise that we have as Christians that the world can't claim is that our good things can never be lost. The truly good, the truly incommensurably good things of our life can never be lost. Because they're not founded in us, they're founded in his faithfulness. That's Romans 8, 38 and 39. Number three, I'm only here for a brief time. For the world who, who lavishes themselves in the tram, trimmings and trappings of this world and they try to grasp to find the, the fountain of youth to be here for a longer period of time, the Christian can sit back and say, you can grab and try to stay here as long as possible, <laughs> but I'm very content that one day I will see my Savior face to face. And for a lot of us in our life, it couldn't come soon enough. I don't fear death. I couldn't be more excited to be with Jesus, to be with the saints that have gone before, to sit in his presence forever. I'm only here for a brief time. This is James chapter four. You're here today and gone tomorrow like a vapor in the wind. Lastly, the best is yet to come. I, I, wanna, I wanna end with an invitation that if you experience in your heart today, if, if in your life your identity is still fixed in the things of this world, if, if you think that ultimate good and ultimate peace is brought on by having more, then I want, to, I want to take you to the top of that mountain right now and to tell you how awfully and terribly empty it's going to feel. Because any pursuit of identity or worth or value or significance or success or meaning outside of Christ is an exercise in ultimate futility. But there is an extension of an invitation that this Christmas season brings in the middle of your mess, in the middle of your brokenness, in the middle of, of what you think is, how could God possibly want me? Who did he show up to? Shepherds in a field nearby saying, here comes the friend of sinners. And so that's where you find yourself going, I am far from God. I am, I am, I am nowhere near the Christmas scene. Neither were the shepherds. I'm nowhere near the elite. Neither were the shepherds. And he came and he said, there is salvation for you. The friend of sinners has come and he beckons us draw near. 
if you'll accept that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, that you have messed up royally in your life as you've rebelled against him and sought your identity in foreign things and, and alternate gods of money, success, power, sex, fame. And you believe that when Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins, he took that away. And you choose to follow him with your life and accept his work on the cross. You will be saved and the Holy Spirit resides in you to which you can then look the world in the face and say, I have the peace that passes understanding now in Christ. I'm gonna ask you to pray with me as we close. Lord, for those of us who know you as Lord and Savior, would you just renew that peace in our hearts that might have gone missing in this Christmas season? Or if we've bought the idea that the only time we're near you is when everything is really clean and it makes a whole lot of sense. Would we remember the, the messiness and the noise of the stable that when God became man, it was in the middle of chaos. That's how we feel. Would we as, as followers of you be reminded of that truth? And God, if we, are, if we are not followers of you, we wanna surrender our life to you this day to give you our chaos, to give you our mess and to receive you as our Lord and Savior and our wonderful counselor, mighty God. Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. So let me pray, amen. If you guys did say that prayer today, I'm gonna to ask you just to make a note of it on the comment cards that you have, not because we're, we're sitting here and we're, we're, someone gets a raise for how many people are saved, because we wanna pray for you. We wanna celebrate what God has done here in the life at Skyline Church. As always, we love you guys and we're excited to see you next weekend for Christmas. Check out all those services online. We'll see you guys then.